Um, so we want to talk about this notion of brand and performance. Um, but first we're going to play a game, so I need everyone to participate. I'm not going to do the snaps like Greg because he was too cool and I can't replicate that. So instead just raise your hand. Um, direct mail. Is this a branding tactic or a performance tactic? Um, if you think it's branding, raise your hand. If you think it's performance, raise your hand. Okay. Um, Super Bowl ads. Is that branding or is it performance? Branding, raise your hand. Performance? Not so many. Um, next one, connected TV. So something you're watching on Hulu or YouTube on your TV at home. Raise your hand if you think it's branding. Raise your hand if you think it's performance. Trick question, it's both. Um, next one is um, email marketing. Brand or performance? Raise your hand if you think it's brand. Performance. Could be both. Depends on how you do your emails. Uh, next one, Google search ads. Raise your hand if you think it's brand. Raise your hand if you think it's performance. Okay? Last one, um, meta. So all things Instagram, Facebook, and yes, even threads. Raise your hand if you think it's brand. Raise your hand if you think it's performance. Facebook would tell you that they're both and that they can be a full funnel strategy for you. Uh, so the reason I bring this up, uh, the 2022 at Cannes um, in France, all of the smartest CMO minds meet together. The most pressing issue this last year at Cannes among CMOs was this. How do we manage the tension between branding and performance? And how do we do it in a way that is successful for our brands? Um, we know this, John, um, th this quote from John Wanamaker who said, half the money I spend is wasted, the trouble is I don't know which half, right? And we know that that may or may not be true in today's world of measurement. But we want to talk about maybe a little bit how to measure some of that brand. Um, and, and let's just start Louis Vuitton. Um, I'm sure many in this room know Louis Vuitton well, own their products. Um, Bernard Arnault, Ar Ar now, um, who's French, uh, this man here is the wealthiest person in the world. Do you think that happened because of brand or performance? I would think it's probably in a large part because of brand. And brand extends far beyond what you spend. It's who you are, it's your core values, it's the quality of your products, your good and your services. So I think it's important to know that in the pursuit of more and of market share growth and of being able to become a brand and category leader, that doesn't just happen with performance alone. It's a balance. It's brand and performance. So we just wanted, I want to just spend a few minutes uh, before Devin gets on stage and just talk about that. Um, ultimately, brand and performance marketing have one goal that they share in common. It's to help raise awareness of your brand by, con or by consumers, ultimately driving them to make a purchase. That's the goal. You want to raise awareness. Nobody ever bought a product they'd never heard of or from a brand that they weren't familiar with. So you need to raise awareness to the point that they're comfortable and you're at the right place and the right time to buy. Um, so we've often at Max Connect talked about these two almost juxtaposition uh, brand and performance and we see them working closely together. Um, brands that want to focus on long-term growth become a category market leader um, when you do it right, you'll see that there's some phenomenal performance. The outcomes, when you look at brand KPIs and how you measure is brand working, that's going to be potentially slightly different than performance. Uh, with performance, we're looking at immediate conversion rates. We're looking at uh, what revenue was gleaned, what the ROAS is, and being able to see um, those two come together is powerful. Um, we found that a full funnel strategy a digital strategy that is omni-channel, um, that's considering connected TV with paid search, that can, that's considering meta or social with programmatic display or video pre-roll, um, does a couple of things. I want to talk about that. There, there's been a lot of talk as rising costs over the last several months, and it's been competitive. We've had a lot of clients, and I'll just pick on the e-commerce industry during Memorial Day. Um, we see, saw a lot of brands lean in heavily and they spent a lot of money. Much to their chagrin, 
their outcome and what their intended ROAS was, which much less than just a few months prior because everyone else was spending all of that money and they're almost on that on cycle where it's really high cost. And when you're focused on those lower funnel channels, you're going to find that costs will increase and there's this kind of um, saying in the industry, go upstream to pan for gold. In other words, how else can you influence these consumers, these customers to buy from you? How can you introduce yourself sooner in maybe a less expensive way? And we found there's some research present that says about a 60 to 40 split of performance and brand from a budget perspective is about that right balance um, in the industry mainly. And so I want to just talk about a couple of kind of these um, frustra frustration points. When you pit these two against each other, uh, you're competing for budget unnecessarily. Um, brand building often loses out more. It was funny, before COVID, it was really a performance, performance, performance. And post-COVID, we're seeing that, um, that brand's voice is getting louder and performances simultaneously. And when those are uh, done together, well, when those are done together, we actually see that there's a reduction of, of that or a reduction of cost. So think about this. What if every interaction with a potential um, customer was at four to fifteen dollars per click that gets expensive across 10 to 15 touch points but removing some of those costs and moving that downward say to 10 cents to 15 cents to 35 cents that's what you can achieve when you're thinking about brand and performance simultaneously just a quick story uh, we have a fantastic client I won't name names uh, that we've worked with for many years they came to us and said, uh, we have a large budget uh, for this upcoming push. We have a lot of leads and ultimately applications that we need uh, to get over the finish line and we're relying on you to help us get that done. Um, they said, what would you recommend the strategy to be, knowing you've run similar campaigns? Uh, we proposed the strategy of which paid search, a very low funnel channel, had probably about 20% of the budget. Fast forward about 30 to 45 days in a conversation with this client, they said, things are going so well. In fact, we're above performance benchmarks of where we would hope to be. We're getting more leads than we had expected and they're at a low cost. Thank you. We don't know what you're doing, but this is working. And we said, well, number one, that's good to hear. Let's go through some of the results and talk about where the leads are coming from. Come to find out about 75% of all of those leads derive from paid search. And immediately the client threw their hands in the air and said, what are you doing, you idiots? Why, are, why is that only getting 20% of the budget? And we said, well, we thought you'd say so. And for that industry, we found that during this period of time, um, it might be upwards of, you know, at 20 to 50 to even $70 per click. So rather than complete on a cost per click basis, we went upstream to pan for gold. We threw programmatic display, through social, through video, began to introduce those potential customers to the brand, to that organization. And what happened was they actually went to Google, put the brand's name in and what they were looking for, and that cost per click was $2 or 250. And we were able to take what would have been really expensive lead generation campaign and shift that dramatically and have a remarkable impact in terms of what they were doing. The other thing that's interesting, if you're familiar, who owns a Traeger in this room? Any Traeger lovers? Camp Chef? Any Camp Chef lovers? Um, I had a conversation a couple of years ago with Camp Chef. I said, tell me about Traeger going public. Tell me about Traeger as a competitor. How has it affected you? They said, hands down, Traeger's the best thing that ever happened to us. <laughs> I said, why is that? They said, our sales are up, revenue is up because they enlarged the market, they enlarged the category. They said they did such a good job building brand, all of us have been positively impacted. And so when you think about it, it doesn't always have to be an us versus them, you can enlarge your category. You can actually find more people in that audience pool and not just fight over less. So there's just a couple of key takeaways. Treating performance marketing and brand building um, as short-term versus long-term gain trade-offs is wrong. It's not always one or the other, and often brand can help in the short-term, not only in the long-term. 
Second takeaway, brand building um, can actually be financially measurable. Um, there's an HBR article that came out 11 pages long about this exact topic a few months ago, and they actually walk through um, how brand equity can be measured and how it can directly impact the bottom line um, in a way that I think can be really meaningful. And then next takeaway, your current performance marketing may not be as measurable as you think uh, in terms of how and where the sell is coming from. Devin's going to spend a few moments and talk about customer um, attribution and what that looks like and how to think more holistically. Um, and he'll, be, he'll delve a little bit more into that. Bonus, um, last takeaway that I had had was giving value back to the customer throughout the journey, finding ways to invest in their experience to make it more meaningful. Um, it always pays off. Um, it breeds loyalty as you improve their experience and provide value along the way. With that, thank you for your time and we'll turn it over to Devin. Um, thanks, Phil. Uh, Phil's an absolute stud. Him and his team have done an awesome job putting this event together, so let's give Phil and Suzanne all those another hand. Uh, my name is Devin Deaton. I'm one of the partners here at Max Connect. Um, me and three awesome men, a couple of them are in the back here, started this agency 10 years ago. It's looked a lot, of, a lot different than it did back then. Mainly we were out of Kyle's attic and we had no clients and we had no employees. Now we've got tons of tremendous clients across the country, 60 plus employees across the country, and it all could, wouldn't be possible without our awesome clients. So I know we have a lot of clients here and not a lot of partners here, and we just want to say thank you guys, because if it wasn't for you guys, Max Connect wouldn't be possible. You know, we always talk about we're only successful when, all, when our clients are, and so truly aligning ourselves with good clients is kind of what's been making, making it magic, so thank you guys. I'm going to talk to you guys today about kudos, which I'm really happy to talk to you about. But first, I need to tell you a story. The story is about these awesome shoes right here, okay? If you guys don't know these, these are the Nike Air Monarchs. These are the quintessential dad shoe, okay? Everything about this is perfect for a dad. My wife bought me this shoe for Father's Day. I'm a huge sneaker guy. So being the marketer I am, I asked my wife, hey, where'd you get these shoes? And like most moms out there, Amazon. Found them on Amazon. Okay, well, how did you get to them before Amazon? Well, I went to their website. Okay, good to know. Think about it a little further. Well, what made you go to their website? How did you find their website? She kind of gave me this funny look. Google, duh. Okay, makes sense. Well, what, what inspired you to go search on Google? What made you think of these shoes? Well, a friend sent me an Instagram story from them. And I thought, oh, that might be a good idea. So I'm sitting there going, okay, so it was your friend on the Instagram story that started this whole journey. And she's like, well, no. I had seen some video ads before for some uh, shoes for Father's Day gifts, and I thought that might be a good idea. Some of the friends sent it to me. I went to Google, went to their website, went to Amazon, and bought the purchase. Now, that might not seem like that crazy of a story. And if I were to probably ask you guys when you bought something recently, kind of how this purchase went, what your journey was like, it would look a lot like this, right? But the difference is here is, being the marketer I am, I, I, you know, I study this and I'm looking at this go, and then I start asking her, okay, what was the most influential thing for you? What was the, you know, was it the first thing that you did? You know, was it like your first click attribution? Was it that? You know, was it the last click attribution? Was it all of it together? At this point, she's looking at me like, what are you even talking about? Like, I don't even know why you're asking me these things. I just, I just purchased something. But as marketers, that's the way we kind of tend to look at things, right? We've been forever like ingrained to be like, you either need to look at first click attribution, you need to look at last click attribution, or you should look at multi-click attribution. But that's not the way consumers behave. That's not the way consumers look at things. When I ask her these questions like, which one of these touch points was the most influential in your purchase? She just gives me a look like, what are you asking me this for? This has nothing to do with anything, you know? To marketers, it does. But the reason why I bring this up, because kudos more than anything is a change in our mindset, right? It's a change in the way we look at things. We've forever been trying to, trying to go back to look at this situation as, sorry, look at the situation as like, well, what was the most influential thing? What drove them to purchase? What was the, you know, but that's not the way consumers look at it. So kudos is a change in the mindset. Google Analytics has done a really good job for us, and specifically Universal Analytics has done a really good job at making it super easy for marketers to analyze their marketing based on all these different channels we're doing, right? 
as a digital marketer, you look in Google Analytics and you're like, all right, I got my display campaigns, I got my social campaigns, I'm doing A-B testing, I'm doing all this different multi multivariate testing on the websites. And right there in Analytics, it makes it really easy for you to say, okay, well, search and direct traffic are, are doing the best. Because based on Analytics and our last graduation, there's what's driving the conversions. So you should put all your money into there. But as we saw in that previous example, that's not the way the customers look at it. They don't think, okay, well, I'm gonna go consume some search, and then I'm gonna go watch some video, and then I'm gonna be hit by display ad. Like, that's just not how the way consumers go. So with Kudos, we thought, well, we're looking at it wrong. We're look, you know, rather than trying to look at first click, last click, multi-click, we need to look at like a customer-focused attribution. Okay, and that's, that's a key differentiator. Google Analytics has been marketing channel focused, strategy focused, the tactic you're doing focused, this campaign versus that campaign, your paid social versus your paid search, what is doing better? But to consumers, that's not how it is, right? So we set out to start tracking it. And we built this tool called Kudos, which we'll talk a little bit more about, but Kudos allows us to track the customer journey. So we basically built a software tool where anytime someone comes to your website and has any conversion, whether it's a phone call, a chat, a form, a purchase, add to cart, a key page view, whatever it might be, we're going to track that. And then we're going to track their whole journey, and we're going to see how they behave. So we started tracking people, and this is an example of a typical customer journey we look at. This person first came to our client's website from a Max Connect display ad. They had five conversions. They viewed a few VDPs, they made phone calls, whatever it may be. They came back an hour later, now from a different tactic. Now from our VIN retargeting strategies. They've been to the website now. We know what specific car they want to look at. Now we're serving them up that same exact car and they bring them back to the website. Well, then the next few times they come to the website, well, now they just type in the, the, the URL directly. Okay, then they leave. Then they come back and they type in the URL again. This time they had 24 conversions. That's pretty cool. Well, direct traffic, and man, they look like they're winning. So when you look at this, it's a shift in the mindset, and this is an ugly looking slide. We've had all these really cool looking slides, but I need to present data. I'm more of a data scientist, so I want to show you some things here. Universal Analytics would tell you with last quick attribution, your display campaign should get five conversions. Okay? So you would look at analytics and be like, all right, display drove five conversions. Okay. You look at your VIN retargeting campaign. You come in here and say, okay, VIN retargeting had nine conversions here, had nine there. Okay, VIN retargeting had 18 conversions. VIN retargeting beat display. That's what Anal it, Google Analytics would want to tell you. Okay, then you'd come and look and you'd look at direct traffic. And you'd be like, man, look at all the conversions we got from direct traffic. We got 44 conversions from direct traffic. So direct traffic beat VIN retargeting. So we should just do, put all our money into direct traffic. And as marketers, we're, we're kind of, we're set with this kind of paradox of like, how do we analyze it then, right? We're told right here that you get a chart that shows all the different traffic sources, all the performance from them, and it's pretty easy to see like, well, one thing wins out another, okay? But what I'm trying to tell you guys today is like, we've been looking at it wrong. So if you look at it in a different perspective, and you look at it from a customer-focused mindset, we see that, well, they first started down the path with display. Well, and they got their five conversions. Then they came back from VIN retargeting. Then they did all this other stuff. Right? So rather than looking at it by these things competing against each other, because they're not. They're helping each other, right? They're helping drive that consumer down the path to purchase. So these things together, your VIN retargeting plus your display plus your direct traffic, you had over 80 plus conversions from this person. Okay? So it's just a draft, drastic shift in the mindset. So put simply, kudos is our marketing attribution and reporting software, and it was built 100% in house by Max Connect. And I take a ton of pride in that because, as anyone knows, to do something of great worth, you have to get the right people in place first, right? We've, a lot of you have probably read the book Good to Great. Good to Great talks a lot about getting the right people on the bus before you know where you're driving. We had this idea of like, all right, we know we need to change the way we're looking at attribution. We know we need to build a new tool for that. But we've got to get the right team in place to know that way we have the right people in place to know where we're going to go. So we assembled the team. Every line of code, every single thing we've done in Kudos platform was built 100% by Max Connect employees inside this building right here. And we take a ton of pride in that just because I know there's a lot of agencies that try to, you know, cut corners or different things like that. And it's like, we take so much pride in building things from the ground up in-house. Here's a little bit look of, here's a little bit about how it looks when you log into the platform. Now we're not gonna dive into that today, but a couple of things Kudos is helping our clients with currently. Kudos is helping them understand their customer acquisition journey. We just went over an example of that, and it's completely shifted that mindset. 
right? Greg talked a lot about kind of looking at things from a different way, like shifting that mindset, shifting that paradigm. And that's exactly what Kudos does. Um, it's also helping our clients with campaign scoring, and I'm going to get into that in a minute. It helps them analyze business trends and make better decisions for their business. So the Kudos score, and then I'm going to get out of here. I know we're kind of short on time. I want to talk to you guys about the Kudos score because I think it's something that is really cool that our team has built. So for the last 10 years that we've been doing this, we've been tracking thousands of different data points and metrics, right? For every campaign, every client, every time you've looked at month-end reports and are reporting, you know you're going to see CPMs, cost per click, click-through rates, session durations, conversion rates, time on sites, all these different metrics. Well, our team set out to say, man, kind of going back to that simplicity thing, is like, what if we could just have like one number? or like one indicator of whether or not a campaign was going to be doing good. We know what all the things are. We know the things we're looking at. We know what all the micro numbers that we're trying to look at, the micro conversions, if you will, that are going to lead to the macro conversions that we want. And so we took data from clients, campaigns that we knew were successful. We knew they had good ROI. We knew we hit their campaign objectives. We, we then went and looked at like, what does their data footprint look like? What is their algorithm? When you look at their click-through rate and their session durations and their conversion rates and their cost per click and their cost per views and all that, what combination of those is a good indicator of a good campaign? What combination of those is an indicator of a poor campaign? And so we put those things into an algorithm that our team should develop and we developed the Kudo score. And the Kudo score takes 25 different little metrics we're looking at and it rolls it up and to easily tell you Oh, this is going to be a good campaign, or hey, this is not going to be a good campaign. So when you log into the system, you're getting this kudos score, and what it does is it's going to give you four different data points. One is the color. We try to make it simple. Your color is either going to be green or yellow. If it's green, that means your campaign is either at the benchmark or above benchmarks. The benchmarks. I'm going to talk to you about that, and then we'll go to the kudos score. The benchmarks are cool because we have all this client data, right? We've been doing this for 10 years. We've got number, hundreds of clients. And we also have industry-level data. So, so often we get questions from clients that are like, okay, you told me that my click-through rate was 0.25%. Is that good or is that bad? Right? It's good. It's easy for us to say that. But if we had some data to compare it against, you could say, well, the industry average is 0.15%. So you're above that. Right? And that's what these kudos scores give you. So if they want to know, is our display campaign doing well? And it's like, well, your score is at 125. The average score for your industry is at 66. The average score for our clients is at 100. So if you're above that, then you know it's doing better. We also broke this down on an individual metric um, standpoint. So in each individual metric you get and all the things you'd like to look at, you're going to get this cool dashboard that's going to show you, okay, green means things are good. So over here, your search click-through rate. So for this client, they have a click-through rate of 7.2% for search. Again, is that good? I don't know. Well, how does it compare to the industry? Well, the industry average is 4.23%. So you're outperforming the industry by almost 2 to 1. Our client average for this industry is 9.2%. So we know we can do better, but things are doing well. Same thing with display, same thing with search. So if you bring back here, I have a little quote here. It says, finally, some data with some relevance. So often we're showing clients all of this data, all these data points, all these things, and it's like, how do we know this is doing well? Well, now we're giving them an option to benchmark it against the industry, their peers, and against our top performing clients. And so this is just a number of the things we have with Kudos. There's a lot to it. Um, more than anything, Today, I wanted you guys to look at analytics with a different perspective, right? Kind of shift your mindset there. Rather than looking at all those different channels, Phil talked a lot about how brand and performance are put against each other, and they shouldn't be put against each other. Together, they're going to accomplish more than they are individually. So rather than trying to always look at, is this channel doing better than that channel? Is How are they working together? We always talk about the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, and that's what with kudos we found. So thank you guys for coming out. I think we're going to turn it over to our Google team here, and that's it. Yeah, thanks, so.